Today we're going to continue in our series called Growing, and we're talking about things that we can grow within us and things that we can grow in our world that make our world a better place. We started with hope and talked about how hope is so powerful and how we need to grow it in us and in our world. We looked at justice and how significant that is always, but especially now as our nation is wrestling, wrestling with race issues for us to uh, live into justice and a biblical understanding of it, to grow it in our world. Last week, Pastor Brendan talked about patience and how important that is as well, that our world and oftentimes we as human beings are in short supply of patience. And today on Father's Day, I want to talk about kindness because uh, the scripture has some interesting things to say about it. And I think oftentimes we forget how powerful, how potent kindness really is. This past week as we were cleaning stuff out of our house and some other things, um, I came across a, a large bag. It was a beach bag, uh, so it had like mesh that was filled with beach toys. Shovels, rakes, sandcastle makers, uh, all the kind of stuff that you would traditionally have for kids. And uh, we're getting past that stage with my kids. Um, they still like to use that stuff, but for the most part, they're done with it. And so uh, I looked at this giant bag that we had with all this stuff in it, and I thought, uh, we're not going to use this again. I should just pitch it. And then I thought, why do that? Let's see if somebody else could use it. So I took the long walk. It was maybe 45 steps from my house to my neighbor's front door. I rang the doorbell and uh, the dad came to the door and I said, hey, look, uh, we're cleaning out some stuff. I got a big bag of beach stuff. Would, uh, would you like it for, he, he has a, a, a just graduated preschooler uh, and getting ready to go to kindergarten. And I said, would you like these beach toys? And he said, I don't know, I'm gonna ask the boss. So he called his wife to the door and I said, uh, I got a bunch of beach toys. Uh, they're right over the hill here. You, you want to see if you want any of them. So she came down the hill. She looked at him. She's like, yeah, that'd be great. We're, we're going to go to the beach. We'll, you know, she, our daughter will use these. And uh, so she grabbed all the stuff. There was a kite and you know, just a bunch of stuff that you can use at the beach. And um, when, when we kind of gathered together everything, she turned and she looked at me and very earnestly looked right in my eyes and said, Thank you for being so kind. Now, I, to be quite honest with you, my first response was, um, it wasn't so much that I'm being kind, it's, it's convenient for me because I'd rather not throw this stuff away. I, I don't like throwing away stuff that I don't have to. So, like, instead of putting it on Craigslist or try, you were right next door. Like, it's convenient for me. But I paused for a moment and just took in something important. She was earnestly looking at me and telling me that this act meant something to her. It was a kindness to her. And I was struck again, and I don't know how many times I have to learn this lesson, how powerful kindness really is, how important it is in our lives, the role that it plays in impacting our hearts and impacting the hearts of those around us. But oftentimes, when you are sharing kindness with somebody else, it does not feel as powerful as it does to receive that kindness. And so, sometimes we just downplay it. We don't think about how significant it is or the, or the way that it can impact our world. As a matter of fact, when I think about powerful and, and things that impact our world, I, well, I think about anger, because anger, anger can stop things. Anger can confront things. And as a parent, like there are moments when, when you feel that, right? It's not just, just living in the world, but it's Father's Day. So let's talk about this for a moment. Like anger as a parent happens when your kids do something they shouldn't do or when they can hurt themselves or when they hurt another. And it, it's a powerful emotion. It, it feels more powerful than kindness. And it is powerful. And it is impactful. And it's very good at stopping things. Anger, because it confronts, can stop things. But I discovered this really powerful lesson in my own life years and years and years ago. One of my children was a hitter. 
they would hit us, they would hit their siblings, they would bite, they would hit her. And so we, um, we punished our children by putting them in time out from early on, from, you know, 14 months old. We'll put them in time out for 30 seconds or a minute or whatever it was. And then we'd explain to them why we did that as best we could to a young child. And the child that was hitting, I would get frustrated and angry because they were like, sometimes out of the blue, they'd just go up and clock their sibling. And I would be like, why are you doing that? Why are you hitting? Why are you hitting your sister? And, and they weren't at the level to have that kind of conversation, but they could feel my anger. And when I sat them in timeout and had the conversation with them, I watched. I watched as, as my anger asking them to stop, which was justified, as it hit them, it wasn't producing what I wanted it to produce. It was a tool to, to get them to stop doing what they were doing, and it worked to that end. But my goal wasn't just to get them to stop doing that. My goal was to see where they were that was causing that and to get their heart to a place where they didn't want to do that. And I realized as I watched that my anger wasn't helping. And so I had, inside of me, I had to ask the question, is this producing what I want it to produce in my child? And I had to say it wasn't. It was not. And so I began to ask the question, what will produce a difference in the heart and the behavior of this child? It didn't mean I stopped didn't stop them from hitting or biting. And then I rethought what was affecting them. Romans chapter 2, the answer was kindness. Romans chapter 2 says this. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? We don't always see that, by the way. Paul is asking that question. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? And then he asks kind of this in our face question. Does this mean anything to you? Your God is so patient, so kind, so tolerant toward you. Does it mean anything? Can't you see where God, your Father's heart is? And then he makes this powerful statement. And when I got this, it really affected me. Can't you see that his, God's kindness, is intended to turn you from your sin? His kindness, his intent with his kindness, is to turn your heart and your behavior away from where it is to a better place to a good place. And you see, many of us grew up with this idea of God simply having anger and having anger about the things that we did wrong. And when you become a parent, you realize why that's the case. Because when you see a kid coming up behind another kid and just smacking him in the head, you're like, what are you doing? It upsets you. And you can understand why it would upset God. Right? But the notion that Paul lifts up is that God pours out his kindness so that we might experience it and it would turn us away from the ugly stuff that we do. His kindness would have that kind of a powerful effect on our lives. Kindness is 
It's being friendly. It's being generous. It's being considerate. Kindness is a form of grace. The definition of grace is undeserved kindness. It's when God is kind toward us and we, we don't deserve it at all. H- have you ever had that happen to you? About a week ago, uh, my wife was making dinner and she came to me and she said, uh, early in the morning, she said, can you at some point in time go to the grocery store and get some potatoes? I'm, I'm going to do a pot roast potato thing. And I'm like, yes, I have meetings until like noon. And then I have a window where I can run out to the grocery store at noon and, and then uh, get back to all the other stuff I have to do. And so a noon came, I didn't set an alarm, which I should have done. And I had another phone call and uh, my world just went straight on. I'm, I don't even remember having lunch. And my wife came to me at about uh, four o'clock and said, I don't see any potatoes. And I'm like, inside I'm like, oh, I really messed up. Like. I told her she could count on me and the family, you know, is counting on the dinner that she's making and she had a time frame for all this and now she's ready for it and I didn't follow through and I'm like, inside of myself, I'm like, you must be really frustrated at me. And her response next was, it's okay. Do you need me to go? And in that moment, I went, no, I got it, but thank you. Thank you for the grace, the kindness that you just get. Because you had every right to get upset at me. You had every right to say, come on, Andrew. I just asked you to do one thing and you agreed to it. We talked about it. You know, she, had, she would have had every right to do that. And instead, she offered me a kindness And as a result, the impact on me in that moment was beautiful. I wanted to do it for her. I wanted to serve her. I wanted to help her. I wanted to respond. It changed my heart. You know, and I, and I could feel like I knew that she had a right to be frustrated and I knew that she had a right to be upset. And I could feel a little bit of that defensiveness rising up inside of me and a little bit of that, hey, I've had a busy day. It's been a hard day, you know, that kind of thing. And, and the beauty of kindness. So Paul in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 says this. He says, since God chose you to be a holy people, you must clothe. Here's the metaphor. Clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Clothe yourself. So here's the metaphor. The metaphor is that when you get up in the morning and go to your closet and ask yourself the question, what am I going to wear? Paul says, I know some of you actually think about that. Now, some of us just throw on clothes. He says, I know some of you actually think about it. And when you think about it, what would it be like to say, today, I'm going to wear kindness. I'm going to put it on. Now, a few years ago, my wife started working for Johns Hopkins. And one Christmas, we got a bunch of swag. We all have these now. Hopkins sweatshirts. And that's not all either. I've got Hopkins keychain, Hopkins planning books, Hopkins pens. My son has a Hopkins pennant, right? And, you know, if I were in any other place but a Johns Hopkins building, I might look like a fanatic if I wore all this stuff. Because it announces something, doesn't it? And I think, you know, in Paul's day, there weren't Hopkins or Syracuse or whatever your college is. There weren't those sweatshirts, nor were there Nike swishes or whatever else, right? There wasn't branding like that in the first century. So when Paul says, put on kindness, that's a really powerful thought. 
He's saying, what if you put on a shirt that instead of having Hopkins written on it, it had kindness written on it, and it made you conscious of what you were doing and how you were acting and how it impacted those around you. What if you were more thoughtful about that? And the power in that image is buried in the notion of how powerful kindness is in and of itself. But he's suggesting a couple things for us that we can't miss. First of all, that it's a conscious choice. I am going to clothe myself. I'm going to decide to be kind today. Now, we don't always decide to be anything, but some of us wake up on particular days, there's already a not kindness about us. Would you agree with that? Maybe that's just Monday for you. But what would it be to say, I'm going to actually intentionally walk around with a notion of carrying kindness with me? How powerful could that be? Second of all, um, clothes and what we wear affects what we can and can't do, right? I mean, when I come home, like I'll do this afternoon, dressed like this, my son will oftentimes say to me, hey, Dad, can we wrestle in the living room? He's 13. He, lo he loves to wrestle, right? And then he'll pause and he'll look at me and he goes, oh, you can't wrestle in that. You're going to have to go upstairs and change. Because you don't wrestle in dress shoes and dress pants. and a dr Well, you can, right? But, but you don't. And here's the point. If you're wearing kindness, what are the things that you do and don't do as a result? If you're wearing kindness, do you fight the same way? Do you fight at all? Do you care the same way? What do you do and not do when you're wearing kindness? The same way that you do and not do when you're wearing shorts or flip-flops or a formal suit. How does wearing kindness impact your behavior and your attitude toward the world around you? The other thing that's so important about this image that Paul says is the clothes make a statement, right? Have you ever seen somebody walk, walk into a room wearing a tuxedo and maybe you've never seen them that dressed before and you were like, as a matter of fact, I've had people say to me jokingly, you know, when I wear very formal clothes, you clean up nice. Because the clothes make a statement about who you are and how you represent. And, and most of the congregations never see me wear it, but I have the tab collar that, that you know, that priests and clergy wear, it automatically, when you see me in that, it automatically does something different. And I'm wondering what happens if we were to metaphorically or literally wear kindness across us. How would it impact the people who saw us if we announced ahead of time we're bringing kindness with us? What might that do? Because I want to suggest to you that I've seen kindness do three amazing things that almost few other things that we have in life can do. The first is it disarms people. I've watched really angry people have a kind person come into their life and it, it can be very disarming to an angry person to have kindness gentleness, caring, brought into their lives. Years ago, I knew a couple. She was a former nurse and, and uh, he, was, he worked in manufacturing. And throughout the course of his life, he was not the most gentle person anyway. He was kind of a gruff guy. But as he got older, his biochemistry began changing and he became an angry angry man and she came to me one day and she said I, I need some help but here's what I watched and even though his biochemistry was was pushing him like they literally began to put him on medicine to help him with this but I watched as her continued kindness and gentleness would dial back 
all the stuff inside of him. Now, it was painful because she oftentimes took the brunt of that, but her insistence on wearing that kindness, I saw that kindness could be even more powerful than some of the strongest emotions in this world. It can disarm us. Second of all, it can open a door. Have you ever been surprised by kindness when someone showed up? I think that's what happened to my neighbor. Like they were just surprised that they were going to get this stuff and it was just used beach toys, right? But like it opens a door to, hey, I wasn't expecting you to care about me. Thank you. You know, that's the power of brownies, isn't it? Just showing up with a pound of, pan of brownies to your neighbor, like, it opens a door. People are like, well, wow, thank you. It has such an impact on lives. And here's the last thing, and, and I think this is so critical. Kindness is defining. It can define who we are. I'm always interested in listening to how people remember others in their lives, especially around funerals and, and times when people are passing. But even aside from that, when people are just talking about good friends and others, how, how things impact them and how they remember them. And, and I'm always struck by how deep and how broad an impact a kind person can have on another's life. I remember sitting uh, in a group of pastors where uh, a pastor was telling their story. In, in 30 seconds, here's what it was. He said, uh, I, I wasn't a believer in Christ. And he said, I was feeling kind of lost. I'd never attended church in my life. And he said, um, and so I decided to attend this, this local church. And he said, um, and... I went to that church and that week, in the middle of the week on a Wednesday, the pastor showed up at my house with a bucket of fried chicken, told us how much he appreciated us being there, and welcomed us. And he said, I was so caught off guard. He said, my whole image of the church was pastors asking for money asking for people to do stuff. And here he was, he showed up on my doorstep with a bucket of fried chicken. And he said, that changed my life. He said, from that moment on, I became open to a journey of spirituality that has led me to eventually becoming a pastor. And he thinks of his own story and his own legacy as tied to that person, that pastor, who brought him a bucket of fried chicken. Now, that pastor had a reputation for doing that. He, he had a reputation throughout the community for doing that. I think there are some people that attended his church because they're like, Hey, let's get some chicken this week. And they went and the, they knew the pastor was going to show up with a bucket of fried chicken. But that's not my point. That pastor had created a legacy of kindness. It's how it defined who he was. And as I listen to folks talk about the people who most impacted their lives, Above almost every other characteristic, you know what rises to the top? When people look back over their lives, what impacts them, what changes them, what impresses them, what moves their heart and their spirit and their soul more than anything else is kindness. Dads, do you get that to the core of your being? Do you... Do you, you, do you get up today and say, I'm going to put on kindness and I'm going to bless my kids and my family with it? Do we do that at work? How do we, in the various roles that we have to, the hats that we have to wear, 
How do we wear kindness with each one of them? And how do we commit to making that part of our legacy? Because that's what our Father's done. His kindness is intended to turn us from our sin and make us more like his son. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for loving us. Thank you for your kindness toward us. The scripture says when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You loved us even when we were just a hot mess. Help us to be intentional about putting on kindness and to know that it blesses your heart and our world and is one of the most powerful expressions of our spirituality, leaving a legacy where we don't even recognizing or seeing the power of it. We pray all this in the name of our Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Sing out with us. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. Happy Father's Day. Today I'd like to share with you some tweets from a Twitter user who's a dad of four girls. At the time I started following him, he was they were ages two, five, seven, and nine. And uh, he tweets about the conversations and the relationships that he has between he and his girls. You ready? Five-year-old, why does perfume always smell like flowers? James, what should it smell like? Five-year-old, macaroni and cheese. Three-year-old, let's have a skip race. James, I'm too old to skip. Three-year-old, why did you grow up? Five-year-old, can I get some french fries? James, you're supposed to be sick. Five-year-old, can I get some french fries and a 7-Up? Five-year-old, can we have candy for dinner? James, no. Five-year-old, can we have candy after dinner? James, yes. Five-year-old, can we have nothing for dinner? Three-year-old, you're strong, James. Yeah. Three-year-old, you're really strong, James. Definitely. Three-year-old, you're almost as strong as mom. Coming near the end of spring break, five-year-old. When do we have to go back to school? James, Monday. Five-year-old, slides a penny across the table. When now? Two-year-old, screeches. James, what's the emergency? Two-year-old, I need cheese. Three-year-old, I'm hungry. James, there's food on the plate right in front of you. Three-year-old, I'm hungry for something good. Five-year-old, do I have to change my name if I get married? James, only if you want to. Five-year-old, smiles, call me Shredder. Five-year-old, leprechauns are fairies. James, they are. Five-year-old, I thought you went to college. James, who drew on the wall? Three-year-old, the crayon. James, by itself? Three-year-old, it's a bad crayon. Three-year-old, will I have a baby in my belly someday? James, if you want to. Three-year-old, no thanks, that's where I keep my candy. Four-year-old, what happens when you die? James, you go to heaven. Four-year-old, no, I mean, what happens when you die? Do I get your stuff? Last one. Five-year-old daughter watching a man on TV do CPR. Why is he kissing her? James. He's not. He's saving her life. Five-year-old. I'd rather die. Happy Father's Day. <laughs>